Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to Raw Knuckles Podcast. Please like, follow, and subscribe. I never cheered for the Montreal Canadiens or, or would have been friends with Chris. And it was my son who said, Dad, I'm, you know, bury the axe. It's 20 years you haven't played and, and, you know, and against Montreal. And you should, and you should be So cheering. your son allowed you to be friends with me? Yeah. A, he allowed me, to, he allowed me to, to, to bury the hatchet that it's over. Like, it was just a job we did. And, so and, that hung with you after your career? Oh, it, hung, it hung with me a long time. See, I could have gave a shit. Up. That's crazy. Yeah. I could have gave a shit afterwards. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, don't know why. I, you know, I was a Montreal fan growing up as a kid, and I ended up in Nordic. I'm a Montreal fan now again. But if the Nordics ever come back, the Battle of Quebec will be on again. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. You guys won't golf ever again if the Nordiques no, are back. We'll golf. <laughs> When I stepped on the ice, I never backed down and I never stayed down. And I was vicious and I was malicious and I don't care. <laughs> All right, let's get going here. Welcome in, Wally, to the Raw Knuckles podcast, my friend. Good to see you. Say hi to my pal, Tim. Hi, Tim. Tim Wally, Stapleton. thanks for coming on. I heard all about your golf swing for the last five minutes. Oh, <laughs> my, my slap shot. <laughs> I got one, too. Don't worry. So I'm yeah. with you. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, geez, Wally, you live right up the street from me. Five minutes. <clears throat> um. What's your connection? I know you're born in Verdun here, in, right in Montreal, but what's your connection to uh, the U.S., south of the border? I know you said your mom lived in Springfield. Or, or Yeah, my mom, my mom uh, remarried and uh, went down to Ho- Hoyoke, uh, Massachusetts. So I was down, in the, down there quite a bit. So you're not an American. You're Canadian. All, Canadian, pure Canadian. You're yeah. purebred. His, um, his historic Anglo, not many of us left here. Right, yeah. Um, so, hockey for you, and certainly growing up here, it's a big thing. But uh, Verdun, I mean, Mark Bergevin, Mario Lemieux, J.J. Daniel, how many other guys? A lot of hockey guys come out of Verdun. What was it with that neighborhood that that guys, you know, gravitated to the game i just think that there you know uh, there was the outdoor race and there wasn't that much really to do and i think everybody loved hockey and the montreal canadians were winning you know stanley cup after stanley cup and uh, you know we just loved the game i i was born in verdun but i was brought up in greenfield park on the south shore yeah which was a, a great little place we had tons of volunteers uh, we, a bunch of us lived in this low housing uh, complex, which we called the barracks. And there was tons of kids and, and farms and places to run and the St. Lawrence River. And, and like I said, great volunteers that put it, put together some great programs of hockey and football. So one led right into the other. And uh, I just enjoyed to play sports. I had a lot of energy. I had to burn off stuff or I would get into trouble. Yeah, you did. So you never got in trouble, you're telling me that? <laughs> well, it would have been a lot more. A lot more if I hadn't for the people that I, I hung around with, let's say. What other sports were you playing? Just uh, ho- football and hockey. And in the summer, um, I just I ran and I fished and I biked. And, um, you know, just what, what kids do. Once, you know, you didn't play hockey 24-7, you, you know, you needed a break, and and I think, uh, you know, we were all chomping at the bit after a long summer to get back into, uh, we started with football, football ended, and hockey would start, it didn't merge back at the time, which I think was good. We so Greenfield have- Park, yep. right, um, and the hockey and the stuff, uh, you played for the Long Gay Rebels, that was the QJHL back then, and was that um, Junior B hockey? They call it, yeah, it was junior B, but it was, uh, you know, below the ma- major junior. Yeah. I, I was captain of that team for uh, three years. We won two championships. I um, And you're a D-man. 
I Natural D, man. Yeah, play D all the time. Um, it was it was a rough league. There was a lot of fighting going on. I could hold my own, and uh, I didn't like people trying to bully any of my teammates in that. So even being captain, I, I would step in a lot and take care of the business when I had to. But I played a lot of hockey. If I wasn't in the box. I was on the ice. Yeah. Do you like so, you like to fight? I mean, I always hear from Chris, you know, his side of things. How how was your side? You like to. Um, you know, I, I always. I was always fighting. It was not something that I liked to do, but I had friends that would start start trouble, and uh, they knew that I wasn't going to run away. So if I was there, trouble would start, and I would wait into the middle of it. So it, it was nothing new for me to go and play hockey and do the same thing. And you're a rather large fellow at 6'2", 205 pounds. Is that true? You're 6'2"? I, I yeah. think I look at you as taller than 6'2". I thought you were like 6'4", but... Um, maybe maybe 6'2", now I'm shrinking. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that with the new hips. Yeah, um, the new hips, yeah. So you, you start out with the Rebs one year, and then the following year go to Bose. Now, Bose, the the Bose Yaros, Jaros or whatever they are. Um, yeah, Jaros, yeah, Bo Jaro. So those that's Saint Saint George de Beauce, right outside right. of Quebec City. Now right. I had a couple of friends when I was a kid. I knew nothing about junior hockey, and these kids from my neighborhood ended up. I found out later went up and played for Saint George de Beauce. Kevin Troy, played Jimmy brothers. Troy, his brothers, yeah, right, the Troy yeah, brothers. Yeah. Were you there when they were there? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That was the first year the team started. So Andre Vea, who was the owner at the time, a millionaire, he decided to put the team together in that league, and he started to buy, pick up players that nobody else wanted. So we had uh, Jocelyn Joe Hardy, our, our playing coach, uh, 200 points, uh, Richard Grenier, 77 goals, Alan Caron, 78 goals, boom, boom, Caron. Uh, Big Jill, Bad News, Bill, was on. <laughs> so the, we either had, you know, 200 points, 80 goals, or and the rest of us had between 300 and 500 minutes in penalties. Not a place you wanted to come in. Wait, into. what league is that? The, the NAHL? North yes. American yeah. Hockey League. So were you playing a lot of U.S. teams? Yes. Yeah. We were, I think we were, we were the only Canadian team. All the rest were U.S. And I played that. that. I played it. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask. Isn't that like a route to go to college too? Like I played in the USHL. And oh, there was nobody that was college <laughs> uh, college bound in that league that I know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So. All right. What were you saying next? What were some of the teams in the league? I was, was going to say it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Was Roanoke in there? Roanoke? No. no. Binghamton, Binghamton Dusters, uh, Hershey Bears. Okay. Um, Johnstown Jets. Well, the, the funny part was is that, you know, we were we were running roughshod over the league, and when they were making Slapshot, they came to, and asked us to – that t, t, Slapshot is, is basically built on the, the – St. George the Bose. The St. George, the Jaros team, even the yeah. same colors, the ugly uh, brown and orange and whatever, Halloween colors. But uh, they came and they wanted us to – to be in that uh, in that movie, but they had time restraints and they had to, the movie had to start right away. And we had already knocked out uh, the Johnstown Jets, so they got to be you know and Steve Carlson and the Carlson brothers. That uh, it was all you know the toughest Carlson brother. He played in the in the World Hockey and, and it was Jack Carlson. It wasn't Steve, but Steve got to be in the movie and he still does. I don't know two or three hundred uh, things. Yeah, they do a ton of. Uh... Uh, promotion the year uh, yeah. for Slapshot, those guys, the Chiefs. So, so you're in both their craziness, all the fighting and everything. Um, at, at this point, now, was that a, a junior team or was it a pro team? No, it was pro. So you go right from Long Gay, Junior B, to pro team, minor pro, uh, and then um, you head to Flint in the eye. And how did Flint come about? I know you're only there for a short time, but how'd that come about? And when you were in Boast, did you think you had a legitimate shot at playing the NHL? 
since I was a kid, I always told people that I was going to be in the National Hockey League, and they would laugh at me because I wasn't the best player on the team. But I worked harder than anybody else, and I always came prepared, and I, and I, I hate to lose. I'll do anything to win. But we have, we, have to go, we have to go back a little bit here in that story because uh, I was living in Montreal, and after my junior, uh, my junior B year, they had promised me, you know, I was going to the World Hockey, I was going to the NHL. I started to read my own press clippings, and I believe that that's what's happening to me. And uh, But when it was all over, said and done, they did nothing for me, and I didn't have an agent, and I wasn't drafted. You know, I laughed. We talked with you. You were only drafted 250-something, and I see you lucky bastard. Uh -huh. You even got drafted. So that year... I quit. I didn't quit hockey, but I couldn't find a job. I had no agent. So I started, I had all these different jobs. I, I worked in, uh, I was a butcher. I, I, I was work construction. You started, were cutting meat? Eh? You were cutting meat? Cutting meat. No. <laughs> I did everything. I was a janitor at Vic Tang's. So, you know, I've done it all. I, I knew, you know me, I, I'm not scared to get my hands dirty. And I've done everything. So while I was doing that, I decided I was going to get out of Montreal and I was going to live with my uncle up in Rodden. It was quiet and, and I could train up there and I, I, I worked a bit of construction. I, I, he had some free weights. I started doing that, the push-ups. the end of my workout, I'd run down to the Rodden Beach, run down the wharf, climb up on the high diving board, do a one and a half in, swim across the lake and wait there and rest. And let me tell you, some days coming back, I was doing the backstroke. I didn't know if I was going to make it. I was by myself. Nobody knew where I was. But I was actually really training well, and I, and I was eating well. I didn't know at the time what I was doing there. Anyways, some, I got a call that somebody, uh, Doug, well, Doug Carpenter was involved. And uh, there was a game going on in Montreal, and everybody was going to either the North American League, the American League. So it was a big scrimmage going on. And uh, I stole my uncle's car and drove back to Montreal and played in that game. And Doug Carpenter saw me. And he invited me to, to Flint, Michigan. And, then I, and he said, I can't offer you very much money. And I said, I don't care about money. I just want to play hockey. And so he, gave me, he sent me the plane ticket. And I went down there. I was couple of weeks playing. That was and, nice. He paid for the ticket, the cheap. Yeah, yeah. Money. Well, it gets better. <laughs> I heard what Lee Norwood said the other day about Doug <laughs> Carpenter and forgetting your name. Anyway, in the meantime, uh, some guys had been on, we were playing on uh, St. George de Beauce. Uh, Dwayne Byers was a, a friend of mine. And he called me while I was down there. And I was writing all my friends and uh, playing in the eye. I, I made the big league. And oh, I was just happier than hell. And uh, Dwayne called me and said they wanted me to come down to boats. So I went and I spoke to Carpenter, and he used my line back on me. He said, uh, you, you, when you told me that you weren't interested, and they were offering me more money to, to go. And Carpenter said, what kind of money? Said, what kind oh, of money? Garbage, man. Yeah, so but like, let's, uh, let's yeah, let everybody know what kind of were money. You, yeah, we were, were you making more then? than uh, the butcher? <laughs> yes, yeah, I'm making more than the butcher. So uh, the 250 US. Well, there you go. Well, that, yeah. that it gives people an idea of what we made back then to try yeah. and get. Yeah, yeah, we were we were doing it for free, but in the meantime, uh, uh, Dwayne has told the owner they're missing a guy. Come down. Uh, Going to offer you 400. That was 250 American, and now 400 Canadian. Like I couldn't believe a guy's offering that money. Never even seen him play. So I go to Carpenter and I tell him that, and he brings the line back. You don't, you're not playing for money, you're playing for fun. I gave him a chance. Okay, fine. I, I'm a man of my word. I stick to it. I keep playing. About a week later, he calls me to his office, hands me my last paycheck and a, tick, and a ticket back home, minus my new skates that he had bought me. And I, oh, I was furious. And I told him, I said, you had me for peanuts here. You're going to regret that one day. And I leave, but I go back to Montreal. I'm, I'm, I'm devastated. I can't. I can't tell anybody. You I lost. I right. lost. I can't tell my girlfriend. You know, I'm back in Montreal. Anyway, I call Boats, 
Bo says, he won't even talk to me on the phone. He says, uh, all he did. He's talking through a, an interpreter almost, and uh, he said, you know, you should have came down when I told you to come, and this and that. And I said, I know I made a mistake. And my, my real mistake was not calling the guy back. I him off, and you know. Anyways, uh, finally, at the end of the conversation, he says, you pay your own way down, and we'll take a look at you. So I called uh, Dwayne Byers, I got in on the bus. Of course, I jumped the first bus out of Montreal. I ended up in Quebec City. But it's a six hour wait for the next bus to St. George de Beauce, but I don't care. I didn't have much, I had a little bit of money on me. I'm buying a little soup out of a, you know, out of one of those machines. And I look over and I see this guy grabs my hockey equipment. He's heading out the door with it. I lose it. I'm after him. Like, <laughs> like I could run like the wind and he, I'm catching up to him. He's going to get pounded. And he drops the bag and he keeps on going. But I don't. I, I stop right there because I'm thinking maybe he's got an accomplice, and this is part of the thing. I chase him, and they steal my equipment. That's all I have. I took my equipment. I went back and I just sat on that bag for six hours with a little cup of soup and waited for the bus. And when I get into St. George, we practice the next day. I tell Dwayne, I said, I got, I have nothing, Dwayne. He says, You come and live with me, and we'll figure it out. You know, I have an apartment and. If you know you make the team more well, great, you get your own place and all that. Anyways, I come. I have the first practice. Uh, I watched the first game that night. They don't let me play. And J.C. Trombley's brother, uh, Renal Trombley, breaks his leg that night. I get in the lineup. Opening. Opening. The door opened a crack, and uh, J.C. Trombley's brother never never got a chance back. So that was my spot. So that's how you, you got and going. Uh, now, how do you uh, venture your way to the Nordiques? What happens there? You're undrafted, and yeah. you end up in, uh, after Flint, you go to Quebec uh, to play for the Nordiques in the WHA. What happened there? So uh, everybody had heard about this team, this, this team coming out of St. George, and they, they, they organized the game in the Coliseum instead of playing in where we were. In Quebec, instead. call us in. Call us and in. we played, I can't remember, some team that need, we normally would beat. The Coliseum is filled. Like, you know, there's 10,000 people. Everybody wants to see the St. George, the Bad News Bears coming in. And, and uh, this te other team, I don't know, Utica or something that we normally would hammer, is, is winning, is beating us. And I can't take it. And I'm not running around. I'm fighting and hitting people like a pinball machine. And uh, um, it was a guy, uh, he, he always was um, the, uh, the, uh, the trainer for the away team. I think it was name in a second. And he was on me every shift. Kid, keep going, keep going. We need somebody like this. We need somebody like this. And, and they were beating us, beating us. And uh, I couldn't take it. Anyways, the game was over and we lost, and I figured, well, that was... That's you didn't fight. Oh, no, I fought. No. Oh, you oh, fought. Yeah. I, fought I fought and I hit people, and, and every shift mm -hmm. was just like more... There was more anger than, than not. And uh, But this guy kept tapping me on the back, tapping me on the back. And, you know, kid, keep going, keep going. I kept going. And anyways, from that game, I thought that was it. It was over. But two guys got an invitation to... Uh, Quebec the year after it was uh, myself and uh, uh, Richard Rainier who had scored the 77 goals and uh, we went down and uh, they tell the story so that summer I didn't know what to do with myself and a, a friend of mine called me and he was selling vacuum cleaners in Ontario was it, and, what, uh, did he ask, ask you for help? <laughs> did he ask you for help? <laughs> he, he asked me for some help he had a the, the three of us were about the same size, and he was running it out of Ontario. So I went down for the weekend, and I saw it. He sent me out with this guy that was selling vacuum cleaners, and it was Filter Queen, four sixty nine ninety. I could break it down to less than five <laughs> cigarettes a day. Was it a Hoover? No, it was better than a Hoover. <laughs> Anyways, um, they taught me how to sell some vacuum cleaners, and every. Every one I sold, I made a hundred bucks, and and my my buddy had made a hundred. The owner made a hundred. He was driving a Corvette. And, you know, I said, "Oh, you know, 
I said, anybody could have a Corvette. It's just another payment. No, he said, it's paid for. He said, so I wow, started to listen. And so when I, I went down, I told uh, Wendy that I was going away for the weekend. Anyways, uh, we got an offer while I was there to go down to Saskatoon and take over the business down there. The three of us loaded up one, the three of us and one of our best salesmen, and we went down to Saskatoon and took over the guy's business. We walked in, the three of us, on a Friday afternoon. We said, we told them who we are, and you're out. And we're in Monday morning, and we don't want to see you. And we walked in Monday. Everything was gone, even the light bulbs. We took over. We started selling more vacuum cleaners in one year than this, in one week, and this guy had sold in a year. So he was this kid that I worked with, my buddy. He was a heavy duty salesman, and no to him meant maybe. And uh, I ended up coming back with a, with a, a van that I had purchased through my, my sales. And when I walked into uh, to, uh, the, the training camp, the medical at the, the Concord, um, they were doing medicals and all that. Kurt Bradbury and a few guys were standing. Well, like, how do you get to camp? How do you get to camp? How did you get the invitation? I had an invitation from after that game. Yeah, after that a, game, okay. He drove his new van. Yeah. And I had a new <laughs> van, okay? And if I didn't make uh, the Nordics, I had, you had a place van. to sleep. Yeah. I had planned. I had a place to sleep. I had plan B, too. I was going down to uh, California. I was going to be a, a surf bump. That was my second option. So as I roll into the medical, everybody, I walk in, I got clogs on like I'm always wearing, a long coat sweater, these sunglasses that they were prescription, but they changed from, you know, night and day. So you can see I had those on. Only wore contacts to play. And they said, who the hell is this guy coming in? And so I told the, I said to the, the nurse here, I said, I gave her my name. And she said, um, I, and I didn't have the invitation. I didn't have the paperwork. She said, hey, and can so, I get a, a said, cheap vacuum? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I got a good deal of a vacuum. And I had a vacuum with me, too. Of course, I left the plot. So the guy, he says, uh, the nurse says, I don't see your name on the list. I reached over. I took the pen out of her hand. I wrote it on the plot. <laughs> I said, there it is right there. She said, so it is. Go right in. And that's how it started. So we had the 14 defensemen were there. They were only keeping six. Eight were signed, and I walked in off the street. And who was the coach at that time? The coach was uh, uh, Mark Boilo. Mark Boilo. Mark Boilo, and he was a great coach. We won the we won the Apple Cup that year for the first time ever in Quebec, and the only time. He put me together with J.C. Trombley. He was my partner, and I learned more from JC in the couple of, the, the couple of years I was with him than I did the rest of my my hockey career before and after. The words of encouragement and that, and JC, you know, he was a magician with a puck, and he he. Uh, but a lot of guys tried to intimidate him. He wasn't a physical kind of a player, but he protected the puck so well. And any time I was in trouble, I'd give it to JC, and it was out of the zone. But people started, they were running him. And I, he was older. He, I don't know, he was 40 at least. At yeah, it was after Montreal, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah you know who he is. And he's, yeah. a, he's a gentleman. And Great guy. He was a gentleman, and he's passed yeah. now. And um, he told me at one game that he said, he pointed out some guy and warm him up, and he said, tonight is his birthday. Oh, I went, the guy, first time the guy tried to run against JC, I came flying in, tow, tow, it was all over. And then any time that JC wanted somebody taken care of, he'd tell me it was his birthday. And JC <laughs> learned that when he told me that. It's his birthday. I mean, hey, Wally, birthday. Uh, hey, Wally, it's his birthday. Oh, oh, birthday today, that guy. Hey, that that I came in so hard, eh, that sometime. I would take JC out too with the guy. <laughs> JC touched JC, I was on the guy. And then JC learned at the last second he would just jump out of the way because I was coming in full tilt. And uh, then people realized, like, stay away from, don't touch JC. Cause that's, uh, I was almost like his pet. His pet. Wait, so you, you went to Alco Cup? You just walked right? into training camp and then just walked into a training camp and. 
just played like, the next and, 10 years or whatever. Were, <laughs> That's crazy. You know, they were, they, I wasn't supposed to make that team. They didn't know who I was. Well, they didn't even have you on the list. No. That's no, insane. No. Well, they did. That's, <laughs> like, that's an amazing story. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, no, no. It's one I would have, I would have like left and been like, "This, yeah, is, yeah. this is embarrassing." Well, if, I had, if I had worked that summer at Saskatoon <laughs> with my vacuum cleaner buddy, I might have walked up and headed for California. But he was, he was so positive. He was so, like, you know, go getter that it rubbed off on me a bit. And I have to give him credit for for helping me make that team and helping me show up in training camp in, in that kind of mental uh, positive attitude. I didn't care how many guys were signed. They had to buy out know, two contracts to to give find a place for me to make room for you. Yeah, and they did. And, and they did. And certainly, you had a value to that team. You win the Avco Cup the f- first year. Uh, the next season. Um, you played three years in the WHA. Next season, you only had 13 games. Were you injured your second yeah, year? Yeah, I had, uh, I had uh, Is that your first big injury, like something? That... Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, what I had was I had two ruptured discs, but nobody could diagnose what it was. And I had a hole in my elbow that was infected all the time. They couldn't get that closed. And they were saying the poison from there was running up my there. And my left leg was completely dead. The pain, you know, I've had my teeth knocked out. I, I, nothing compares to a ruptured disc. And and my left leg was going dead. They were actually helping me tie my skates to get out there. And I was sitting on my gauntlets just to try to get some kind of relief on the bench. And when they called my name, it was to go out and, and scrap. And they had the guy, boys on the bench were Wally, Wally, take your, you know, take your stick with you. Like I would just come over, the <laughs> and I fight till I get thrown out of the game. Take your stick with you. Yeah, take your stick, Wally, and your bucket, so you can carry the puck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The feet, what was training camp like back then? Was, did they have? They didn't. Did, did you just? It was like, rough. Was there was there testing and stuff like that? And testing. Oh, you know, you did. Uh, you were you, you were skating twice a day. For two hours and the medical and the and all that, I would have rather have skated for four hours in a row than play two hours and then go for lunch and then come back. You were so sore. Yeah, that's what it was back then, right, Tim? Yeah. Back in our day, you know, I remember early in my career with Montreal. You would there'd be four teams. You'd play one, so we had a game at eight in the morning. Uh, and then we'd skate afterwards, and then we'd go in and change, and then come back and play at, like, 1 o'clock. The other group would play, you know, we'd play from 8 to, like, 9, 30, 10 o'clock, then they'd be on from 10 to noon, and then the next game we'd play would be at 1 o'clock. It, it was crazy. Like, you had double sessions all the time yeah. at training camp. And they did that again, in Russia. Right, Wally? They were, that's, that's, I mean, some guys came in shape, some guys didn't, right? Well, that that was my uh, my trick. But that was back when guys were coming to get in shape. Me, you know, I when I showed up at training camp, I was already peak. Uh, like I trained. Well, you were swimming lakes and shit. Like that's. What I, I was, was like, yeah, no, I, I mean was, that's why I was, I was asking. I was, <laughs> I was like, you must have I was been like a guy. <laughs> I was running, biking, fishing, yeah. baseball, running anything. door to door with bag yeah. cleaners, selling, cutting. You're at the top of your game. You're doing it all, yeah. So, so those three years you played uh, uh, WHA, then the merger happens. How happy were you? Because here you are in WHA, you are playing pro hockey, but it's not the NHL. How happy were you, uh, one, that they merged with the NHL, Quebec Nordiques, one, and two, how nervous were you thinking, woo, the NHL now, uh, am I going to? Am I going to stick with this team, or are they going to look in another direction? You know, that was never in my, a mindset of mine that I would not make the team. I mean, every year the, the reporters would ask me, where are you going to play this year? Well, I'm going to play here, of course. Uh, you know? And um, so the, i go back a little bit. The the, uh, the When I only played the 13 games, I went in and I, I, I ended up um, – 
having an operation. But in Montreal, in Quebec City, they wanted it back then. They would open your back up like about six inches, and they dig around in there and pull the disc out. Well, two specialists were talking to me. Finally, George Morris said, our physio guy told me, "Well, it's not that you're not your elbow anymore. You got a ruptured disc at the time." So I, finally, he lost his job for telling me that. So I went in and I, I spoke to two specialists, and one wanted to take the bone off my hip. One wanted to dig the disc out. They were talking in French, and I wasn't sure exactly what was going on, but I realized that two specialists couldn't make a decision. And they said, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to go to Montreal and get a second opinion. They said, you can't go to Montreal. I said, who's going to stop me? You two. And I got up and I went. And I found a guy in St. Mary's, Carl Sutton. He was doing an exploratory kind of a thing. People from the States were coming in. And they injected the solution of papaya inside my disc and dissolved the jelly from the disc, which presses on your nerve, into my system. And he said, we can always operate. We, but let's go one step before. And I thought that made sense to me. Anyway, he kept me in the head of done, and he kept me in the hospital and uh, for a week. And he only told me when I was leaving, he said, by the way, be careful, Wally. He said, you had two ruptured discs. So imagine these two guys get in and take a bone off my hip. Oh, yeah. I only have a, that contract. You're lucky. My contract's over that year. Guinea pig. I like it. Anyway, thank God. I got back into the, to the playoffs that year and did my normal thing and signing into the uh, – they wanted me to sign for five years. And we made the deal. And my only stipulation was I was dealing with Marcelo Vu, who's just yep. moved it. That if we merge with the National League, because that was the rumor, my contract would go over there. And my contract would be a one way, no matter uh, if I played in the National League or, or the American League. One way. And now, again, it goes back to J.C. Trombley, who told me, well, they offered me a one way contract or two. Of course, the two is, is, is more money. But I didn't know what the difference was. He said, well, they take the least amount of money now, and you will stay here for two years. And I told that to my buddy Richard, but he was such a goal scorer and such a player. He said, no, he went for the most money. Guess who they send out? Richard Grenier. Right. And, uh, you know, and uh, so I made that deal, and they signed, Marcelo Bush signed me for the five years. My dream comes true. I'm playing in the National Hockey League. If you're like me and you're going to play some golf this summer, you have to check out this hidden gem. Windmill Heights sits atop the beautiful hills in Notre Dame de El Perot. They have affordable rates and they offer customized membership opportunities for all levels. If you want to book a tee time, call 514-453-7177. Hit them straight. If you love your pet like I love my St. Bernard Adele, you'll want to feed them a balanced, biologically appropriate raw diet. The reason I've chosen Formula Raw is because all blends of their food are locally sourced and they consist of exclusively human-grade meat and organs, as well as fruits and vegetables. And all products used are hormone and antibiotic-free. So like I said, if you love your pet like I love Adele, you'll choose Formula Raw. Make sure you go to FormulaRaw.com and use the promo code RAWNUX at checkout to receive 10% off your first order. That's RAWNUX, R-A-W-K-N-U-X. You know, yesterday they made a big deal. And I know, cause I don't know if I, I'll ask both of you guys this, but like, you know, they made that big deal with Bedard and he's playing against like his idol Crosby. Did you have anyone like you fought and when you for for the first time and you're like I can't believe I'm fighting this guy like meaning like you you kind of grew up watching him or you're like you know uh, you know kind of like an idol that you fought I know you guys fought each other I'll get to that later but I'm just yeah saying. my idol Chris yeah. <laughs> Moni Dal called but is there someone like when you put, when you now you're in the NHL was there someone you fought right uh, the first you time? know I didn't uh, I never I never thought about fighting anybody and I, I think it helped me. I never wanted to go after anybody. I, I would only settle it if somebody was trying to bully somebody else. I never picked anybody. I, I never, I never watched games before and watched like, you know, the, the night before the game, 
Uh, you know, the next day, uh, I don't know, Boston would be playing in Montreal, and then it would come to Quebec City, and uh, Bergie would say to me, uh, did you see the game last night? I said, what game? <laughs> Boston, like, no. Well, what did you do last night? Oh, I, had, I, took, I, went, I took my wife out for supper. I relaxed. I watched a movie. I, I never thought about fighting. The next day, I'd get up. I'd skate in the warm-up. I, I, I'd practice. I'd go home. I'd have a nice meal. I would eat, I would uh, eat, I would sleep well, I'd wake up at four in the afternoon. Now I start to think about it. Okay, okay, Boston's coming in. They got, uh, you know, O'Reilly and this guy and that guy. And I go down early, I start taping sticks, having a coffee. Now I'm starting to get myself wound up about what's going to happen, who I might fight and all that. Never singling one guy I'm going to go mm. do this I want to play the game I want to play hockey yeah well that's not odd either right because I remember back in that day I never watched hockey like I I never watched a game say Quebec was playing someone and and they were coming in here the next game uh, and, and it's it back in that day it wasn't like it is today right you got the NHL package you can see any game you want back then you, you didn't have many options to watch a game, right? Hockey night in Canada, yeah, but, and, you know, most of the time we're playing, you know, Saturday night. So it's not like um, you could watch those games anyway, but um, that's funny, you know. Uh, Bird, well, you asking, did you watch the game? <laughs> you're not getting psyched up about that. You're, we're a different breed because I know people – that had to take a shot. Uh, they were they were calling each other. We're going to fight, uh, you know, on the, the, the second period and all kinds of stuff like that. I never liked the organized fighting and everything. I never did that. Oh, I didn't either. I didn't, you know. Just the stage. It was part of the game. Yeah, That's, when it happens, part of the game, I got it. And, now, and a lot of guys that you know having some mental problems, I think because they thought about it uh, too much in advance. And got themselves all worked up, couldn't sleep, couldn't eat, couldn't rest, had a couple of drinks before, things like that, a couple of shots of vodka. I, I can't believe that. But, you know, these are friends of mine I know, and, and like, you know, they, they suffer, and they're still suffering through that, through the mental stuff. That well, it's like, you know, you bring that up, and it's, I, I was the same. Listen, I thought about who I was going to fight. I did. Like, I knew Boston's coming in tomorrow. Okay, the chance I'm going to fight O'Reilly, Jonathan, maybe Secord, who knows? Now, or later, Jay Miller or Curran or, or, or Gord Kluzak. But I didn't sit home and, like, all night be, oh, my God, I'm going to fight someone. I slept well, ate well. The day of the game, I slept like a baby. And once I woke up, boom, I was right out the door, whether I was at home or at the hotel. I had... I, I didn't like sitting around the house. I had to get to the rink, so I would always go early. And you hear a lot of guys saying, yeah, I was nervous the night before. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't, uh, whatever. And I get that. There's some people, uh, they're made up differently. I think times when I would say that, people would question it like, really? Really? And they found it odd. Like, and and you, you have the same mindset that way. I... I, I really wasn't. I, it never kept me up at night. Listen, when I got to the rink before the game, and I'm sure, uh, I'm not sure, but I'll just tell you my own feelings that I was nervous. I couldn't show it. You know, I, I'm there now. I'm thinking, okay, I could be fighting O'Reilly. I could be fighting Jonathan tonight. I'm going to be ready. And I would keep myself occupied. I'd talk a lot, you know, not to sit there and be. Like, you had guys in your team you could look at. You could tell they were scared shit, right? Oh, yeah. And you couldn't show that, yeah. right, even if you had those nerves. So, yeah. It, yeah, it's not an easy thing. And guys do have issues after. But it, so you're there, NHL, Bergie's a coach. Is this his first year, Bergie? Yeah. All right. Well, Jacques, the Jacques Demers was still there. Yeah. And I, I love Jacques as a, as a coach. Uh, he's uh, – a great man, and uh, you know, uh, yeah. So some people. So say, he got shit canned, and Bert, how did he get shit canned? I don't know how that went down. He, so he gets shit canned, and Jacques, Bergie comes in. Jacques, I, I do, I do know what happens. He's too nice of a, of the to the players, and the first yeah, the year, maybe, 
the player, yeah, the first year that you play with them, you, me, I'll go through the wall any day for a job. But some people start to take advantage of that. He's too soft. He was too close to the players. Uh, and it happened in Quebec, and I think it happened in Detroit and a few other places, because that's the way Jacques is. And I think that's why he got canned. Okay, so Berge comes in, and he comes out of junior, and he has a reputation, no? The Tiger, Le Petit Tig? I didn't know any of his, of his reputation or who he was, actually. I tried to be, uh, you know. It's a new coach. I, I, I told him I do anything you know, you know, for the team. And if you needed anything, let me know. Uh, you know, my, I'd been there a couple of years already. The guys respected me. Uh, so how about him? Did he respect you, the coach? Um, I, I don't think so. I think he had other guys like, uh, that he wanted to bring in. He didn't know what I had done over the years. And, and and uh, you know his guy he had he coached Jimmy Mann right yeah so I think he wanted he was trying to get Jimmy Mann in to take my spot I mean there was always somebody trying to take your spot oh yeah you know, it, it goes without saying right yeah so he organized a, a scrimmage uh, Jimmy was there I don't know for the first year maybe this second year maybe and uh, he was sitting training at the, camp yeah sitting at the blue line he wasn't on the ice the scrimmage going on. And I was standing up on the blue line, and, and uh, Jimmy tried he tried to get out, come out with a puck. He had his head down or something. I leveled him. <laughs> and um, so Jimmy gets up, and he, Jimmy has one punch. He's a lefty. and He's a lefty, big punch. And, and I just, I knew that, and, and he threw it. I ducked underneath it. I grabbed him. He wasn't that strong on the skates. And I put him down, and I was hitting him. And Bridget was sitting right on the blue line. And over the other side of the glass, and I was like, "This, this, this is him. This is your guy." <laughs> so he wasn't. Uh, we didn't really start off on the greatest of foot, let's say. So here's one for you. Yeah. And this is one. Listen, when I played, I remember in Halifax, all the fights I had, I got called up, and I always promised myself that if a coach ever told me to go out and fight, I was going to tell him to go himself. Mm -hmm. And I stayed true to that my whole career. And I never had a problem with that. I think I made it obvious that, um, so coaches never asked me. Bob Berry never asked me. LaMaya didn't. Uh, none of them. And until it came to uh, Jean Perron, he made the inference he asked me, when's the last time you had a fight? Chris Nyland, when's the last time you had a fight? In other words, go get in a fight, which yeah. I didn't like, and I confronted him. That's how I ended up getting traded. Were you ever in that situation, and did you? Uh, what did you do? And did you like that? A coach well, telling you to know, go fight. Uh, my ice time started getting less and less. Like, I don't mind you when you're in the heat of the action, you get into a fight any time. Yeah. But when you're sitting on the bench for a couple of periods and then the game gets out of hand and, and uh, you get thrown over the ice. And, of course, I don't think there's any coach that ever will admit to sending somebody out to, to fight because that's, you know, that's not what they're supposed to do, but it happens all the time. So Berge decided he was going to make me a left winger. There you go, <laughs> Tim, right? Go, yeah. and it wasn't you go from score. defense it to wasn't wing. Score. Yeah, yeah. And I was kind of like skeptical about that, but he said, you know, it would prolong my career. Hmm. Okay. Think Play about wing it. and forward? You're a utility yeah, man? Yeah, forward, this and that. But I knew I was getting sent out. He would always deny it, uh, going out after somebody. So I, I'd be sitting on the end of the bench. I remember one night Philly's playing and they're – handling us pretty good in the third period. And uh, he yells down the bench to me, Wally. Are you still awake? <laughs> your skate's tied. <laughs> you know, and, and Mel Bridgman had been running around. Philly had a tough team. And Mel, oh, yeah. I, didn't know Always. Who, I didn't know who the hell Mel Bridgman was. I'm not studying players, right? So he yells down, you know, Wally. And I yell down the bench to him, what? position and he yells right wing <laughs> I, 
I'm a left shooting defenseman. I'm playing right wing now, but I'm facing off against Mel Bridgman. And as I went over the bench, one of the Gary the Riviera yells, watch it, Wally, this guy's tough. Yeah, he was. So I line up against him, and he looks up at me. He knows I'm out there to fight, and he smiles at me. He's missing four teeth, right? Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Anyway, the puck hardly hits the ice, and we go at it. Eh? I smacked him a couple times right in the mouth, and he just smiled at me with the four teeth missing. <laughs> and I didn't know it at the time, but he did it on purpose. He grabbed my wrist here with – I was holding him here. He grabbed my wrist, and with the other hand, he took my elbow, and he dislocated my shoulder in one move like that. Uh, on purpose. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah I didn't like know that at the time. But I got to respect the guy because my shoulder was in my armpit, and I, I was like, oh, hang on a second. What's up? He never threw a punch at me after that. He knew what he had done. We went, I went straight to the medical room. And they laid me over the table, and the doctor pulled it down and shook it, went back into place. And when it goes back into place, it feels so good. Like I said, right. okay. There's no pain at that moment. I said, okay, thanks, doc. I said, I'm going to go back out. He goes, no, no, you're done for the night. I said, no, no, I'm going to go out, kick the shit out of that guy. And I said, then I'm done for the night. No, he said, well, you don't. No, you're not going out anymore. That's it. You're a dislocated shoulder. Thank God he was smarter than me. Because by the time I went and took my shower, I couldn't get the, my hand up to get the soap out of my hair. And if I went back out, Mel probably would have done it. Oh, he would have killed you. He would have, I would have had two dislocated shoulders. You would have had a dislocated nose. Oh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe. I was lucky with my nose. It's still pretty straight. How did your yeah. guys' fight go down? Did you guys know each other then? Were you like Chris. thinking... Yeah, were you like, hey, well, you know, I want to go on this guy's podcast one day? Were you <laughs> now, Wally? I heard you. <laughs> I heard you. Yeah. And good question, Tim. I yeah. heard you say the only time you fought is when you were sticking up for teammates. Now, why would you be fighting me then? Okay. What would what would I have done it to was one your of them? birthday? Poor it was little your birthday. fucking hot yeah. yeah. way. It's his birthday. It's his birthday call. It's it's a well, well, birthday. Island, that island guy. I don't like him. But um No, no, but you you would run around and uh What do you, you mean know? I'd run around? I fucking <laughs> played fucking the game. Dirty. Oh no, you played the fucking game dirty. Dirty. Yeah. We were shutting down the fucking Just big line, Francis and shutting them down. Michelle Goulet? No, Did you this, you brothers. This is when you and Hoffman. We, we fought oh. we fought in Quebec too, right? So you guys fought a couple right. times? But, yeah. So, so you must have been like, you know, you were playing your game. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I gotta come out and play my game. Let's just yeah. say that. Bergie, get, Bergie gave you the tap, said, go get no, an island. No, no, he yeah, loved yeah. you. He, like you're playing he center. You're you playing center. center. Go get that. He would have swapped me for you in a heartbeat. <laughs> You love it, you. Your French is so good. <laughs> but uh, but so what's up? We go to Hartford, right? Jack Evans, Tex. I don't want. I don't want to go to Hartford yet. I want to stay in Quebec. I haven't. I'm oh, not yeah. done with fucking Bergy yet. He brought oh. up the fight. Yeah, I oh. want to hear. I did, I did, yeah. What happened? You chased him. Okay, I, I, I don't really remember. Uh, well, what are we talking about? The battle at Quebec, or yeah, oh, I don't the... really remember when we fought in uh, Montreal. I only remember Hartford. I have concussion syndrome. It kicks in when I need it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the Battle of Quebec, just say, uh, I want to go to the Montreal, the Quebec games and the intensity of those games. Like, come on, the Adams division back then was tough, right? Boston, Buffalo, Hartford, Quebec, Montreal. It, it was crazy. It, right. Like, regular season games in that division were like playoff games, Tim. I'm not kidding. Like you play eight Absolutely. times a year. Every game is for the Stanley Cup, Montreal, yeah. Quebec. Yeah. With beer wars. Yeah. You know, um, you had Molson owning the Canadians, O'Keefe owning the, the Nordiques. You yeah. had, uh, so, you know, little Quebec City, big Montreal. Um, you had the Genal de Quebec, the Genal de Montreal. And the, the fans were just rabid about those games. Now, for you – and in that team, I know Bergy always tried to make it like us against the world, right? Didn't he? Right. Yeah, and the big bad Montreal Canadiens. We were this, we were that. 
Uh, how crazy would Berge get in those games? Like before, like when he talked to you guys, what would he like? What was his his stick, if you will, before those yeah. games? Well, you know, Berge wasn't the X and O guys behind uh, the Quebec Nordics. It was Charlie, Charlie Tifo was, was. Uh, the, the doctor of hockey out of Pepsi University. And uh, I just want to say something about him, first of all, because I owe him an apology. Oh. Uh, he brought me in his office one day and actually wanted to teach me some hockey. But by this Who's time, that? Charles Tifo. Oh, Charlie Tifo. Was, okay, the assistant coach. Uh, he was doing video in the beginning, like Roger Nielsen. So he brought me into his office. He wanted to talk to me about, I'm sure, positioning and playing and forward and everything. And I looked at him and I said, Charles, you want, you're going to teach me how to fight, Charles? And he just shook his head and the meeting was over. So I always <laughs> wanted to say that, get that out to him somehow. Well, he, he, he won't be watching this probably. <laughs> you never know. You never know. Who knows? And, okay. Uh, sorry, Charlie. Yeah. Sorry. Charlie. So that was sincere. That was. <laughs> yeah. Sincerity. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Anyway, but so Berge, what he was, was, as we say in French, Brasseur la Marche, he could really stir up the shit. And that's what yeah. he was good at. And he would, you know, oh, he put it in the press. We're going to get Mario Trombley tonight. I oh, mean, yeah. you know, we'd be skating around in warm up and it was all we could do, not to fight in warm up. We hated each other so much. It went on for 20 years after I, I, I retired from hockey. I never wanted to go and see it. I never cheered for the Montreal Canadiens or, or would have been friends with Chris. And it was my son who said that, you know, bury the axe. It's 20 years you haven't played, and, and, you know, and against Montreal. You should, and you should be So cheering. your son allowed you to be friends with me? Yeah. A, he allowed me, to, he allowed me to, to, to bury the hatchet that it's over. Like, it was just a job we did. And, and, so that and, hung with you after your career. Oh, it, hung, it hung with me a long time. That, See, I could have gave a shit. Off. That's crazy. <laughs> I could have gave a shit afterwards. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, don't know why. I, you know, I was a Montreal fan growing up as a kid, and I ended up a Nordic. I'm a Montreal fan now again. But if the Nordics ever come back, the Battle of Quebec will be on again. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. You guys won't golf ever again if the Nordiques no, come back. We'll, we'll golf. <laughs> That's funny though. I I never knew that. Like you hung on to that. I I could never. I I could have gave a rat's ass. And part of it too. I played for Berge in New York, so yeah, yeah. you know we had a relationship outside of it. But like you said, Berge always liked me. Yeah. I would skate around the warm up in Quebec, uh, Tim, and Berge fucking be staring at everybody <laughs> like fucking. On the bench, like I hate you guys, right? And I come whipping around. He look at me and he go, he wink at me all the time, like, oh, "Hey, Chris." I think he was trying to soften me up. It yeah. didn't work, <laughs> but it no, was no, funny. He always, you know, he got his dream when he played in New York for him. So yeah, I like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he um, yeah, he was a character, one of the characters of the game. Yeah. Here's one, Mark Hardy. Remember Mark Hardy? He played yeah. L.A. We yes. played together in New York, Tim, and Bergie's our coach. So Bergie comes in second period or something after uh, after the second period. He comes in, he's giving everybody shit, and he comes to Mark Hardy. He goes, Hardy, call this. I remember you, and uh, what's going on tonight here? We need uh, tough on us, he call this. He said, uh, I remember you in the Quebec League when you were tough about that, <laughs> right? So Hop was sitting there like, okay, I get it. Go out and start running people, get involved. So the game, whatever happens, happens. About two weeks later, we got a morning skate at Madison Square Garden. And James Patrick used to skate around and warm up before everybody got on the ice. And he'd skate backwards like crazy. He had happy feet. And he'd bomb it around, doing figure eights all over the ice. And Bergy was standing at center ice. And James comes fucking whipping around backwards, doesn't see him, hits him. Bergy goes up in the fucking air, he comes down, hits his elbow and his head. And he's fucking lying on the ice going, ah, fuck, ah. 
And we all come over like concerned. <laughs> and Mark Hardy yeah. says, Hey, Bergy Tabanak, I remember you used to be <laughs> tough in the Quebec League all this. He said, Mark, oh. yeah. Oh, he, I'm telling you, if you could have seen that moment and, and, and been there for both moments, it was so funny. <laughs> and Bergy was just like, but uh, he was, for me, he was an awesome coach. Not so much for you, right? Not so much. <laughs> yeah, I guess. He, sent me to the, he was the first guy to send me to the minors. Yeah. So, uh, so, so that, that was uh, that was eighty eighty one. You went. Uh, you were played fifty four games that season, but you played seven in Roch. Was that at the end of the season? Rochester. Yeah. When did they send you? Um, they sent me. Was that the first time uh, going the minors? Was Roch? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I don't want to check. I, I was the player. I was the player rep, voted in by the team, and Bergy really didn't like that. And uh, he wanted someone like uh, Dave Pichette or, or yeah. Peter Stashney, but it was voted by the team, and it was for life, or as long as I played for the team, right? So. Uh, we had uh, we were in training camp and we were going to Three Rivers to play against Montreal, but there was a few games before, and you weren't allowed to play three games in three nights. And uh, so I played the first game, I played the second game, Hunter and that too, and like I was wondering why didn't you, you know, and the, didn't spread those guys out because the third yeah. game was going to be in Three Rivers where he had coached, and and we were playing against Montreal. It was his dream. And why didn't you spread that out? But I didn't say anything. And guys were coming to me, well, yeah, we're not allowed to play three games in three nights. So I, I called the, the league and, no, you don't have to play three games in three nights. So we, Wilder had just been born when he was in the hospital. I told her, I went and saw her that morning before the practice. I said, I'll be back to get you and, and Wilder. I said, because I'm not playing tonight. It's three games in three nights. But I got to go practice and, and see the team and I'll come. So did you go tell Bergie, listen, how did you find, you went and told him, listen. After practice, Oh, he has a bus waiting outside and we're going to Three Rivers and he calls me into the office and he says, is it true, Will, you can't play three games in three nights? I said, yeah, you can. So he said, but if you wanted to, you could. I said, I guess so. So did you Call play? East did you want to play? East <laughs> guy in that, that put me on the on the spot, and he asked them one by one. He said, "You're this is your third game tonight. It's training camp. We're trying to make the team. You don't have to play. It's your third game. Do you want to play? Yeah, okay. On the bus. On the bus. Everybody got on the bus. I'm the last guy. And he says, "You? What do you want to do?" I said, "Let's get on the bus." We got on the bus. We had no cell phones. No nothing back then. I couldn't tell my wife. My wife was stuck at the hospital with a newborn. I go, I get on, go down the three rivers. Like, so that was his little, little shot. And, and then he didn't like that. And so, and I had the respect of the players that he was trying to gain. And then he sent me Christmas day or two days before Christmas to Rochester. And, uh, that's a great was, move. He wanted me to go down. Oh, to go down the, the Fredericton or something, uh, there was a, a Rochester, and there was a snowstorm. The airport was closed. And he said, you're going to Rochester. They need you down there tonight. I said, I can't go down. The airport's closed. We're going to charter a plane for you. What? <laughs> and when I went home, I told Wendy the story. He really wanted to get rid of you. Oh, he plane. wanted me out of their bed. Charter you a plane. And he charter me a plane in a snowstorm. He wanted me to be <laughs> gone. So anyway, I said to him, like, I got home and I told Wendy the story and I said, if the phone rings, don't answer it. Anyway, I never answered the phone and I was on my way to Rochester the next day. And that's when I meet uh, Iron Mike Keenan for the first time. Oh, Tim played for Iron yeah, Mike. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So there was, you go. There's another. How is that? Oh, okay. I'm not alone. I'm not alone. <laughs> so he, Mike, Mike is just starting. He's on his way up, right? So I get there and we play the first game and we lose like three, one or something. And we drop from first place to second. That's how close the standings are. So the next, we bust out all night 
to the next town that we're going to play in, but we're not going to play that day. We have a day off. We have a practice. And we have to be on the bus at 11 o'clock. I'm always early. I, I'm there on the bus at quarter to 11. comes 11 o'clock. I said, okay, let's go. He said, well, the coach is not here. I said, I heard he likes to jog. Maybe jog over, I said. Anyway, the bus takes off without him. And we get over to the rink. He comes storming in on a taxi and he's furious. And the guys are terrified of him. And who took the bus and all that? Well, it was weird. Anyway, he bag skated us for a couple of hours. <laughs> and he, uh, oh, then he, he stood at the red line. And half of us went to the board and back, board, each time board and back. And every time I skated, oh, I was in top shape. I skated to the board and came back and looked him right in the eyes. Is that it? No, go again, go again, go again. I could have went all day. He knew, he thought he was going to drop me, but he wouldn't. In the end, he said, Weir, you're hurting this team. <laughs> he said, dude, give me some laps. I started skating around and around and around and around. He jumped off, so then I said, okay, it's over. So I went, I took a shower, got out. All the boys were, ah, the coach, he's mad. He took the bus on us. So he jumped on the bus by himself and he took it back to the hotel. So they're all, they're all crying and everything else. And so I say, team meeting. I didn't know where the hell I was or where I was going, but they all followed me like the Pied Piper. And I headed down to the first bar I was seeing and we went in there and started the party. And anyway, we shut her down and I went back to my hotel room and I told, uh, I called room service. I said, but don't bring it up till 10 o'clock. I wanted to have a little nap. So banging on the door, and this guy showed up, who the hell? I opened up the door, and I ordered myself a roast beef and an asparagus soup. So I said, put it beside my bed. Must have been a nice hotel, huh? Oh, beautiful <laughs> place. Anyways, I, <laughs> as I go, <laughs> go to eat it, I flip the bowl of asparagus soup into my bed. <laughs> but I don't care. I eat the, the steak, and I fall asleep. Well, the bus was leaving at, at, uh, at 11 o'clock the next morning for pregame skate that night. I wake up at, or it was 10 o'clock. I wake up at quarter to 10. And I realize, like, if I'm not there by 10, I said that he's, going, he's taking the bus without me. But the pillow was stuck to my head from the asparagus soup. And I had no time to shower. So I get on the bus and he sees me. I mean, it looks like asparagus hanging up. He just shakes his head. Anyway, we should play and come back. And I have a good meal. Again, I sleep well and I come down in that night. And I ended up, I, I set the American League record. I was, I was in a bad mood and I didn't want to be in, in playing. You hung over. So <laughs> for our night. And I set the American League record for penalty minutes, 54 minutes that night. And as, um, uh, well, Robin Wally. Burns, Robin Burns loves to tell the story when he's introducing me at a golf tournament. He said, he set their lead record 54 minutes, and he said, if they would have let him play the third period, he really could have done it. <laughs> anyway. That is a lot of minutes. I mean, I, I have it in the NHL at, there you go. is it 42, maybe? I don't know. I think it's I 42 follow, minutes. I follow your stats. 54 yeah. is like what I had my whole career. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway um so we have a week off and uh i'm more or less i'm stuck going to be stuck in rochester with mike keenan <laughs> really we don't we're not hitting it off right off the bat so he sends me home to get my uh my some clothes and that because i just i thought i was going down there for a week but he's telling me i'm down so i get home and get your clothes so I go home to get my clothes, but for some reason I bring a pair of skates and a mouth guard. That's all I bring and I'm carrying. So I get home and my wife hasn't seen me for a while. She makes me a nice dinner and a bottle of wine. I'm sitting there and for some reason it was her journal to Quebec. And I flip to the back page like we always do where the sports is. And I see that Toronto, had, uh, Quebec had played Toronto the night before I got the crap kicked out of them. Uh, Wolf Paymore running around and this guy and that guy. And I just looked. So you I got just, called up because of me. I, I, was, <laughs> I, I was terrorizing the Nordiques. No, no, it was we were playing Toronto. They were oh, playing Toronto. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Toronto the, the next night, which is the night I show up in Quebec City. 
I push my dinner away and I tell my wife I'm going down to the rink. She said, I have a call. I haven't seen you. Yet. What are you going down there for? This and that. I said, I don't know. I got to go. I just got to go. I took my skates, my mouth guard with me. I'm walking in the back of the Coliseum. Who did I run into? But Brigie. He said, what are you doing here? He said, we never called you up. I said, no. Just home to get my, some stuff. You know? He says, uh, you have your equipment with you? I said, no. I said, I heard you run into, had some trouble last night in Toronto. You have your equipment with you? I said, no, but I brought my skates. He said, go see the trainer and get some equipment. I went down. I called my wife. I said, you want to see a hockey game tonight? You better get over here early. I don't know how long I'm going to last. Anyway, I went over the board. The people were going crazy. I grabbed Wolf Payment was the first guy I pummeled, and I went around just <laughs> going crazy. Mike Keenan never saw me again. <laughs> well, lucky you. Lucky yeah. you. Lucky him. Yeah. <laughs> I was a handful back then. Yeah. All I wanted to do was play hockey and win. Everything else was secondary, the rules. So, yeah. so the Nordiques, uh, that ends in 83-84. Uh, you go to Freddie, and then uh, the following season, you end up in Hartford, and that's when the bout happens between yeah. Knuckles and Wally Weir. And you go see Tex Evans in Hartford. What happens there? Well, when I got there, I was, I was playing more hockey than I had ever played before. I had a regular shift on defense and I was fitting right in. And I remember a story in the paper around this time, Halloween, Hartford is in first place. It's Halloween. It's scary. And everything was just going, you know, right my way. We'd gone into Quebec City. We had beat them. They came in to interview me. I, and I told them, I said, Christmas, you know, looking at, at Bergy and everything and smiling. And I said, Christmas come, came early this year. I was so happy. But we go back and uh, we end up playing against you guys. And, you know, we had fought before. You, you skated in at the end of a, of a shift and, and you just clipped Mike Liu. Just yeah. didn't knock him down, but just rushed him. And I came in right away, but you tripped and you slid into the, the corner, you're on your knees. And I skated in and we were on my knees. No, no, picking, we picking you know, on me. If you wanted to, to fight fight me, you would have jumped right up. So maybe it was the end of your shift and whatever it was. I respected you enough. Okay, we're gonna fight another shift, another whatever. Well, Tex Evans never forgave that. And we didn't fight that night. And uh, I was like a, a scratch for the next six games straight. I, he scratched me, a healthy scratch. Oh, because two, you didn't come after me? Yeah, because I wouldn't leave okay. on you in the corn. And uh, I said, I fought him before. It's, you know, I'll, I'll fight him again. It's, it's not a problem, Tex, but no, he sat me out till we, play, we played you again. I guess I had a first shift, we, we had to fight again. But when I look back at Tex's career, I find out later that he, Emil Francis, who was the general manager at that time, got knocked out by a guy on the same kind of a play, but knocked him out. That's a different story. And when Emil Francis came to, he was the goaltender, Tex Evans and somebody else were hitting themselves over the head with no helmets on with sticks. And there was pieces of scalp on the ice, from what I heard. And, he te and, and Emil Francis said at that moment, as long as I have a job in hockey, Tex will be with me, and he kept him. Wasn't much of a coach, but he, I guess, you know, he was a man of his word, and uh, Mill Francis. Should have made him a scout. Yeah, should have all right. him. Yeah. It was, uh, I remember no, that we, fight you and I had, right? Yeah. Right inside the blue. It was a good bout, right? Yeah. You know? What kind of fighter was Nux? He was kind of inside scrappy, Cheeky. tough, Cheeky smart. Fight. <laughs> oh, good fighter, you know. We didn't get to the National League because we don't, you know, we don't know how to fight and protect yeah. ourselves. And I always, on. I always picked on bigger guys than me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. And yeah, you were bigger. Yeah, yeah, you were bigger. Right. Yeah. The thing is, I really wasn't a heavyweight. I mean, I'm just under six feet, and I'm two hundred pounds. I mean, is yeah. that a heavyweight? I don't think so. But I fought no, all heavyweights. No. It's, it's a middleweight. I mean, you're, a, you're a heavyweight. I'm 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 maybe light heavy. Sure. Bill Bellado was a heavyweight. 
We knew we were bad news. We were 192. Joe Bellado came off the farm at 220. Solid muscle, never lifted a weight. That was a. That I was fought a bad news in the American League. He was part of the reason uh, I got called up. So, yeah. you know, you play the Hartford, then you go to Pittsburgh, end up in Baltimore. What, what makes you say I'm packing it in? 85, 86, Baltimore skipped jacks. Um, 300 minutes in penalties. Angry, angry young man. Well, I don't know. How, how old were you then, the last year? going to be uh, 32, probably. I, I can't do the math. 32, in the prime. So, in the prime. <laughs> and 32. At, at that age, at that, people were looking at you that you were over, over the hill at 32. I mean, you know, 300 minutes. I had to fight every Tom, Dick, and Harry. Right. They all came out there. They, they, they want to try it. Me. They want to beat me. And it, take it right to the, the, to the National Hockey Yeah, that's, that's the, the ticket. Now, and but, that sucks. Know, Right? That I, sucks uh, at the end, right, Wally? At, it's sucks you know, at the end. You're older, right? And you're yeah. playing down there, and fuck, every Tom, Dick, and Harry wants to fight you. That, that's that's it, difficult. It be, but, you know, my thing back in, back in the day, I was in NHL whenever it is. I skate around and warm up, and I look in the other end. And if I see, I see a guy, I look him in the eye, he puts his head down, I got no problem with that guy. The guy that's staring at me, okay, he, I know that he's ready. So yeah. I do that, and I would know ahead of time who really is going to try me. And most of the time, they didn't have a chance. The gloves yeah. were in their face, and it just did I just—I never put my fucking head down skating by you. No, you never That'd did. Be a you know that would have been, <laughs> yeah. no, been a mistake. That would have been a mistake. Oh, for sure. I mean, like cowering, cowering before the game starts. Oh, so, game. so the skipjacks that year, um, you pack it in, Sam. I'm, I'm done. How difficult was it you to, for you to walk away? Or did you have enough, Sam? Like, what, what was that decision like? Well, I, I had had enough, and and you know, like you, you know, when you start riding the bus and eating the hamburgers and everything and traveling and putting your take care of your own equipment and putting it on frozen, that's just part of it. But when you go, when it goes to the end and you've been on planes and food and hotels and now you're you're sleeping on the bus and carrying your own equipment and putting it on frozen and playing, it's a different kind of a thing, and you know, and having to fight every night and. Uh, yeah, I was winding it down. I was I was getting tired, and uh, I I was thinking, you know, I had uh, oh uh, Baltimore three hundred and sixty five murders a year. Yeah, not the place you wanted to bring up a family. Yeah. So I was sure. like, uh, Gene Ubriaco was the coach, you know, Ubi. Yeah. and he Ubi. was uh, Ubi Ubi Ubi, and uh, so Steve Carlson was playing uh, back at the. He was the captain of that team, and. Uh, you know, he's supposed to be a tough guy and all that, but his brother was tough. Too. Steve right. wasn't so much, but he, he fought a lot. So you and, pack it in. You pack it in. Right. You come back to Montreal, and you right. have another career that lasted up until, what, about five years ago. You ended up, and you were well, never f afraid of work, and right. work you did. So what did you do well, when you, you know, retired? I, I sort of hung around, and I did one summer, and I was training. And like I had done the, the summer before, uh, after Pittsburgh, not finding a job, calling everybody. The only guy that called me back was Jacques Demers. Said, you know, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in Detroit. We've got Co Kosher and uh, Prober and all that. I wasn't scared to go down. He said, I, I can't offer you a contract. He said, maybe it's time for you to find another job. So he was the only guy to call me back. And yeah. I started thinking about it, and I was training, and I thought maybe I kept myself in shape. And that summer, nothing was happening. This and that. Okay, what am I going to do? And I had a had a chance. A friend of mine said, "You know, why don't you go down and uh, put your name at the Port of Montreal?" And so and the then, longshoreman stuff, right? Yeah, well, there was a longshoreman in there uh, who who handle all the cargo and the uh, and drive all the heavy machinery and that. But there's a bunch of other of us, hundred or so, or, or checkers, and we help coordinate the loading and unloading of container traffic and tell the longshoremen where to put it and what to do with it and ship and rail and, and train and everything. We're the ones that know where it goes. They're doing the machinery. So, so and they said, you know, and you, you do that and uh, and when you find a better job, you quit. 
And I worked down there 28 years. Wow. So I had the pension that I needed and the medical I needed, and I had something to do and uh, kept me busy. And I had, uh, became a permanent employee, and I did that because uh, one of the guys, the boss, told me I went and took a job that nobody wanted, and they wanted more money to do the job. And when I saw him, I said, he said, there's no more money. I said, it's not money. I said, I want to know when I take this job permanent, can I take time off? He said, you can take as, when you're a permanent employee, you can take as much time off as you want. I said, pardon? As much time off as you want. Fantastic. I was coaching hockey. I had my family. So you had some flexibility. I had a lot of flexibility and people to this day said I, I slipped through the cracks. Yeah, you yeah. did. Yeah, God, I, I used to wonder if you had a job. I'm like, does he have a job? Yeah. Hang on. Hang on. They're calling me right now. From the board. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll be, I'm there in a second. I'll be there. Yeah. But as he's teeing off at Summerlee on the first <laughs> or. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, I didn't like to work uh, Friday past noon. Uh, not, well, that's not a good thing. That's yeah, a good yeah, thing. Yeah. So you <laughs> listen. You had a hell of a career. You're never afraid to work. You got a great family, good people. Um, you know, health wise, you're in there. You had a couple hip surgery, right? You had, yeah, your hip. That's uh, me, uh, I, That was uh, I was walking like Quasimodo there for a couple of years, but again, uh, St. Mary's Hospital, another. Larry Lincoln, another great doctor, a friend of mine, golf partner. He did both hips, one after the other, or the year apart. And I'm golfing. And I, I did some downhill skiing, uh, skating. Uh, no. Yeah, you, know, well, you, you live life. You uh, you do. You you travel. I you have a good life. I have, my, so I have, have a good life. My health, I have my family. I have some good friends. I'm back in Montreal, where I'm supposed to be. And, you follow uh, hockey? Do you, you, you follow hockey? You follow Are hockey? It? Do you watch a lot of hockey today and follow the game? You know, I, I, my, my wife is kind of like, uh, you never watch hockey when you play. I thought you were one guy that not was into the sports. So, of course, I, you know, I watch uh, hockey when there's a good game coming on and other sports. I watch it, you know, the, the Super Bowl and the, the World Series and that. When it gets down to the final, I really enjoy that because I know it's not about money. It's about people wanting to win. And that's what I enjoy the most and brings out uh, the, the real men step up. In, yeah, in- I really, yeah, I'm with you on that. I love watching playoff, yeah. uh, any sport in the yeah. playoffs or any of the majors. It was so rough for this sports. year's uh, final, the, the, the beginning of the Stanley Cup. I wasn't sure anybody was going to make it to the final. They mm-hmm. were killing each other. It was... You know, and the fighting, it's, it's, it's got back to where it should be. There's no organized fighting. The guys go out and something happens and there's a fight the way it should be. And then we go back to playing hockey. That's the you way think, it You think you could have played? played? You think you could have played in today's game? Could I play? I would find a spot. In today's I would, game. Uh, yeah. I would, I, I would be playing the game smarter now. I would learn more. I would do things differently. I always, I always was fairly fast. I was always in shape. I would do things differently. I would I listen to uh, Charles Tifo and guys like that, and maybe I'd watch right? a little. <laughs> I had Charlie with, Tifo in New York. I never. I, felt, like, I, I didn't understand that. You know, go in. I played the game. Why do I have to go back and see what happened? How yeah. bad it was. Right. Let's go to the videotape. Charlie uh-huh. Tifo. Listen, yeah. Wally, uh, awesome to talk to you, buddy. And uh, I appreciate you joining Tim and I. And um, yeah, we'll maybe we'll get another golf day in here. Come Hopefully on. Hopefully there's some yeah. weather coming. All right, Always Tim. nice to talk with you. Thanks, we've been, Wally. We've been pretty you. blessed. Thank you. And, <laughs> help. and uh, good luck with your podcast. And uh, all yeah. the best to you, Tim. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Raw Knuckles podcast. Don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe.